Um, um, why I'm speaking about the things that I'm speaking of. But this, uh, this Sabbath, I just wanted to reflect back on the cross. I figured it, it, would, it would be a great, it would be great to just look at the cross and, and see as a reminder. So I had it all pretty much put together and then all of a sudden, um, a lot of things took place in our country. I think lately everything has been, uh, uh, if you've noticed lately, everything is uh, unprecedented now, you know. First time this, first time that, everything is now, everything is changing, it's changing. And then, um, and I'll say this very, very honestly, you know, I felt a tugging at my heart. Tugging and tugging and tugging and not to change the sermon, but to add something to it. And I always pray, and you should pray this too, that I am right, that the right spirit is tugging at my heart. Because there is another spirit out there that's always wanting to deceive. And don't think that we are, <laughs> that it's not allowed to tug at our hearts. But the original title was Never Man Spake Like This Man. But I'm about to share with you my personal thoughts right now. This is just my thoughts, okay? And as we look at this picture, you're thinking, no, this is not another sermon on the we the people. But as I've been looking at this country, and I've been looking at it and looking at it, and we have just been bombarded and bombarded and bombarded with changes upon changes upon changes. We talked about it this morning in Sabbath school. We talked about discernment, how it is almost non-existent, how the definitions of words don't even mean anything to you, anything anymore. And um, I heard this, or I read that this, this, this week, and it was a little, little question and kind of explain the mentality of where we are today. And the question was simple. I'll, I'll, I'll ask, and please don't answer it. Answer it in your own mind. And the question was, how many legs does a dog have if you include the tail as a leg? Oh, somebody said five, right? And I said, no, the person said, no, four. Just because you call the tail a leg does not make it a leg. That's where we are today. Then, I cannot come up here and describe the problems that we're having in this country. You should know this. So last night, I was like, then how, how can I get the point that I'm trying to get across? And then I was just impressed. Do your two last slides first, but change a few of the things so that you can get a perspective of what's going on in this country. And as I read them to you, you're going to probably, you're going to recognize this great quote, but I just changed it. I changed it. Okay? And it's pretty much America as I knew it, as I know it has gone. In its place, another idea of America, the sort of utopian land for which many have been longing for, not me. Were this transformation to take place, what would be the result? The country's fundamentals, the Constitution, and the federalized structure of the government that it delineates would be destroyed. The fundamental principles that have sustained this great nation for the past 200 years plus would be accounted as error. Going on, a new ideology would be established where kings and lords would be as one. History would be rewritten. A system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced where words don't actually mean what they once did. The actors of this system would go into all the educational systems and do a wonderful work. The Constitution, of course, would be lightly regarded and its spirit would be dead, as also the God who inspired it. Nothing or no man would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. 
if you haven't been watching the news. God being removed, they would place their dependence on human power, which without God is worthless. Their new foundation would be built on apostasy. And they will eventually persecute those who love God. I don't know if you recognize it. But let's begin. In John we read, Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. If I was to describe where we are today in this country, this is it. And the people which sat in darkness saw a great light. And to them which sat in the region and shadows of death, light is sprung up. When this word sat, what is this word sat? We talked about this before. It means to dwell, to reside, to remain, not to sit down. I truly believe, as Tony mentioned this morning in Sabbath school, I really believe that we have now entered in the time of darkness. Let's start our sermon. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And, and you know the, what was wrong with that? Nothing. Nothing. <coughs> but it interfered with the powers that was in control at that time. Who was the powers? Rome. But Rome was just being used by the religious powers to enforce his ideas, and to crucify those that got in their way. Just like he's done at the beginning. No one would be allowed to be standing in the way. Was Jesus any different? They sought to kill him, didn't they? Why? Because he did not go along with the quota. He did not go along with the new system. He did not go along with man's ideas. What did he come to do? To bring you light. He was the light. What was so wrong that Jesus was doing? What was it so much that they hated about him? We read that Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness, all manner of disease among the people. And his fame... There's a problem. And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. And there followed him a great multitude of people from Galilee, and from Decapolis, and from Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond Jordan. One man cannot have this much power. Kind of, you think about today, does one man have that kind of power today? Not that I am comparing him to Jesus. No, not at all. I'm just drawing a parallel. I'm just drawing a parallel of one man that has so much power and influence today that they're doing everything to destroy this person. Everything. And it doesn't matter what they do because as lawlessness as it is, nobody discerns the lawlessness because those that actually have the power to do something about it do not. This is the exact same mentality and exact, exact things that were going on during the time of Jesus. Where did it put Jesus in? put him on trial. We read that Jesus faces Annas and Caiaphas. Then the band and the captain and the officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him and led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. There's something wrong with that. Now Caiaphas 
was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die. For who? Don't you see the parallels? It's not so much that one man should die today, but one man should be destroyed so that this new movement can continue to move forward because this is what people who don't understand that this country was made on the principles of this beautiful document that we have, which in the spirit of prophecy says that the spirit of the Constitution would be eradicated. We read that we need not be instruments of unrighteousness. In John, Caiaphas was the one who was to be in office when type met anti-type. When the true high priest came into office, each actor in history stands in his lot and place. For God's great work after his own plan would be carried out by men who had prepared themselves to fill positions for good or evil. It's a big stage. There's actors and everybody is taking their place. In, a, in opposition to righteousness, men become instruments of unrighteousness. But they are not forced to take this course of action. They need not become instruments of unrighteousness any more than Cain needed to. And the chief priests and all the council sought for witness against Jesus to put him to death and found none. Do you see another parallel today? What's going on in all these in all these courts and all these secret hearings, all these January 6th, and all these things that is going on? It's, it's amazing. For many bear false witness against him, but their witness agreed not together. And there arose certain and bear false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and with three days I will build another made without hands. But neither so did their witness agree together. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Answerest thou nothing? What is it with these witnesses against thee? But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ? And this is what I really wanted to focus on. I just wanted to take a parallel so you guys could look and see at the times that Christ was alive. Pretty much, pretty much parallel the times that we are alive today. But this is the key thing. I didn't want you. I put the end at the beginning because I don't want to take glory and credit away from what Christ went through for us. But we read, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. To the charge of the high priest, Jesus said, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you hereafter, Shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven, with dignity and assurance, with these words spoken, for they fell from the lips of the one whose spirit went with them. The only begotten Son of God was the speaker, and into the hearts of his hearers flashed the conviction. Never a man spake like this was the original title. Weighed with such great results, this was to Christ one of the most wonderful moments of his life. You ever stop to think that, why? You know, I, I used to read the Bible and I would read the stories of Jesus healing and he would hear the lepers and he would hear all that came unto him. And I always found it strange why Christ said, go and tell no one. You ever reading that? <clears throat> that troubled me, but in a way it's like, why Lord? I mean, you're the son of God. Why don't you want everybody to know? this. There's a reason for it. He realized that now all disguise must be swept away. The declaration that he was one with God 
had been made, he had openly proclaimed himself the Son of God, the one for whom the Jews had so long looked. He had openly proclaimed himself, who? The Son of God. Amen. Amen. Consider what is so wonderful if you are playing a role. Right? What is so wonderful if you're just playing or pretending to be as they teach you that, oh, he's just called the Son of God. What is so wonderful to say that I am if you were just role playing? But to Jesus, it was wonderful. What kind of God will find so much joy in pretending? As we read, remember the story when Jesus was with his disciples? And he asked them, who do they say that I am? Remember? I love that story. And then what does Peter say? Amen. Yeah. I repeat it and I repeat it over and over again how wonderful this truth is. It's wonderful. You know, and, and I can't even, I mean, it's literally brought the Word of God back to life to me. We read this is one of the times when Christ publicly confessed his claim to be the Messiah the one for whom the Jews have so long looked, weighed with such great results, it was to Christ one of the most wonderful moments in his life. When? When he was being convicted. When he was being falsely charged. When he was on trial. He realized that all disguise must be swept away. The declaration that he was one with God must be openly made. His judges looked upon him as only a man, and they thought him guilty of blasphemous presumption. What are we supposed to be declaring today? The very exact same thing. Amen. And what times are we living in today? It's a parallel of injustice, of tyranny, of everything that was in place when Christ was alive. Who represents Christ here on earth now? You do. What do you think is coming your way? But it should be wonderful for you. But he proclaimed himself as the son of God. He fully asserted his divine character before the dignitaries who had arraigned him before their earthly tribunal. His words spoken calmly, yet with conscious power, showed that he claimed for himself the prerogatives of the son of God. What are we? Sons of God. And Amen. And daughters. <laughs> Can't forget that. <laughs> Amen. So every word of Christ's reply was an arrow aimed by no uncertain hand. The judges rose up and confronted Christ with the angry vehemence. One after another asked him the question, Art thou the Son of God? To all came the answer as to Caiaphas, I am. Oh, will not the dignity revealed in that pale face bring discernment to these men? Will not his bearing impress them with the truth of his words? On this occasion, impressions were made that were never faced. The actors in the scene went from place to place, hoping to find relief, but never did they gain the peace and quietude they sought. And that's true. And I believe that we are in the cuffs of time where people who reject this truth of who God is, who the Son is, and who the Spirit is, will not find this peace. It gave him great joy to say, I am. After this, Jesus was nailed to the cross. It was uplifted by several powerful men and thrust with great violence into the place prepared for it, causing him the most excruciating agony. And I know 
we talked about this morning about Christ being crucified and refreshed. We don't need to expand on it anymore. But it's painful. It's painful. And now a terrible scene was enacted. Priests, scribes, and rulers forgot the dignity of their sacred office and joined with the rabble in mocking and jeering the dying Son of God, saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And some deridingly repeated among themselves, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. You know, uh, I put that in, in uh, highlighted in yellow for the reason that every time I read this, I always go back to the 40 days in the wilderness. What was one of Jesus' temptations? Cast thyself down from the temple. In other words, Jesus knew what he was about to go through, and Satan was offering him a way out. But Jesus said, no. He's going to go through this for who? For you and I. <clears throat> he trusted in God and let him deliver him. Now, if you will have him, for he said, I am the Son of God. And they that passed by railed on him, waging their hands and saying, Ah, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest us in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. These men who profess to be the expounders of prophecy were themselves repeating the very words which inspiration had foretold they would utter upon this occasion. Yet in their blindness, they did not perceive that they were fulfilling prophecy. You know, my wife always asks me, Lucy always asks me, doesn't the papacy and all these people who are doing these things realize what they're doing? They're in acting prophecy. All men will one day confess that Jesus is the Son of God. With awful distinctiveness do priests and rulers recall the events of Calvary. Vividly they recall the Savior's parable of the husbandmen who refused to render to their Lord the fruit of the vineyard and who abused his servants and slew his son, they remember, too, the sentence which they themselves pronounced. The Lord of the vineyard will miserably destroy those wicked men. In the sin and punishment of those unfaithful men, the priests and elders see their own course and their own just doom, and now there arises a cry of mortal agony. Louder than a shout, crucify him, crucify him, which rang through the streets of Jerusalem, swells the awful despairing wail. He is the Son of God. Yeah. Amen. That day is coming. It's not now, but they will hear the message. He's not acting like the Son of God. He hasn't been given that as a title. He is literally the Son of God. Yeah. Remember this morning, what was a, my key point that I was trying to make on Sabbath school? Do you believe? Help my unbelief, if there is any. Should be our prayer. Here is a loud cry of despair. All men will one day confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Do you see? You can't claim that believing in the Trinity. There can be no plan of salvation if God did not have a son to send to take our place. Does God speak the truth? Does Jesus speak the truth? Does the Bible reveal the truth? Yes, it does. In great controversy, we read, It will be seen that he who is infinite in wisdom could devise no plan for our salvation except the sacrifice of his son. So if there is no sacrifice of a real son, then there is no plan of salvation. And, and you know what? I was talking about Actual discernment and during the times that we live in, and I was going back and forth on texting with another small group that I'm in, and, and we go back to the same old story. There is no law. And there is no law. And as I tell them, well, without the law, there is no sin. Then without a sin, I don't need a Savior. And when I say that, 
It doesn't compute. <laughs> it doesn't compute. If we have no laws in this country, I can speed, and there's no need for tickets, then why do we have courts? We don't need courts. Why do we have courts? Why do we have courts? It doesn't compute. This is the mind of the people today. The lost ones will admit this at the second resurrection, but the faithful redeemed will confess the Son of God. Where? In the Christian witness. Where? Here. Our life. Orthodox Christianity has failed to understand and teach this vital truth. My favorite story. <laughs> One of my favorite stories. There's Joseph, there's all kinds of, but this is, this is great. He said, what of Abraham and Isaac? As a familiar story unfolds in the spirit, we recognize the important lesson that is made known only through a father and a real son. Isaac had been a comfort, a sunbeam, a blessing to Abraham in his old age. And although this gift of God seemed so precious, so dear to him, he was now commanded to return it to the giver. Isaac at first heard the purpose of God with amazement, amounting to terror. And I don't think that I wouldn't be filled with terror myself. But he considered the matter fully. He was the child of a miracle. If God had accepted him as worthy sacrifice, he would cheerfully submit. And we have to stop. And we have to stop. I do at least. I stop and I think of Christ growing up as a child. As he reads the scriptures for himself, and as he reads through Isaiah and all the books that prophesy the sufferings, and everything that he goes through. And his father's spirit is telling him, this is you. This is what you're going to go through. What does he say? You don't think that he was tempted with food? And I say he was because even in Calvary, what was his prayer? If there be another way. But there wasn't. All this for you and I. He was a child of a miracle. If God had accepted him as a worthy sacrifice, he was accepted. Jesus, I mean. Life was dear. Life was precious. But God had appointed him, Isaac, to be offered as a, as a sacrifice, he comforted his father by assuring him that God had confirmed honor upon him and accepting him as an offering. That in his requirement, he saw not the wrath of displeasure of God, but special tokens that the Lord loved him in that he required him to be consecrated to himself in a sacrifice. As evidence of God's approval of the faith of Abraham, he gave him the name of Father of the Faithful. The example of Abraham is recorded in sacred history for the benefit of his believing children. The great act of faith teaches the lesson of implicit confidence in God, perfect obedience to his requirements, and a complete surrender to the divine will. In the example of Abraham, we are taught that nothing we possess is too precious to give to God. Human judgment may look upon the command given to Abraham as severe, too great for human strength to bear. Abraham's strength came from who? God. He looked not at the things which were seen with mortal vision, but at the things which were eternal. And we were talking this morning, Tony. Lately, I have been looking at things and it's like things are starting to lose their human value to me. What good is all this? I mean, I, me personally, my personal faith, my personal conviction, not yours, my personal conviction, my studies, what I have always learned and what I have always looked for, it's at the door. And that being said, everything here on the earth doesn't matter anymore. It really doesn't have any more value. They're going to be taken anyways. 
God required no more of Abraham than he had. In divine compassion and infinite love given to man, he gave his only begotten son to die, that guilty man might live. Abraham's offering of Isaac was especially designed of God to prefigure the sacrifice of his son. All the grief and agony Abraham endured during the three days of his dark and fearful trial were imposed upon him to give us a lesson in perfect faith and obedience, and that we might better comprehend how real was the great self-denial and infinite sacrifice of the Father in giving his only son to die a shameful death for the guilty race. The lesson, how real was the infinite sacrifice of the Father in giving his only son to die? Very real. When we claim that he was just given that title, does it take away from the realism of actually giving up a literal son? Yes, it does. It takes away all the power of the cross. Our Heavenly Father surrendered his beloved son to the agonies of the crucifixion. Legions of angels witnessed the humiliation and soul anguish of the Son of God but were not permitted to interpose as in the case of Isaac. No voice was heard to say or to stay the sacrifice. God's dear son, the world's redeemer, was, ins was insulted, mocked at, derided, tortured until he bowed his head in death. What great or what greater proof can the infinite one give us of his divine love and pity? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Amen. 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 The meager conception that many have of the worth of the soul and the sacrifice of God's dear son for sinful man is shown by our works. Should God speak to them as he did to Abraham, sacrifice your possessions, the temporal benefits that I have lent you to my advance to advance my cause, they would look in astonishment, thinking God did not mean just what he said. Their riches are as dear to them as their children. Their worldly treasure is their Isaac. Now I know nobody in here, but men will show all the faith they have if God should speak to them and command them. Two, offer one of their beloved children. They would think him a hard master. Yet he has done more than this for us. But there are many who know not what self-denial self or sacrifice or devotion to God is. They never can have an extended and elevated views of the infinite sacrifice made by the Son of God to save the ruined world until they surrender all to him. Before your possessions, before your worldly things, and before all these things that give you or us identity, what does he want more than that? And to him, he wants your sins, because to him they are what? A sweet aroma, because he paid for them. They belong to him. The claims of God upon our love, affection, and possessions, our talents, and ourselves are correspondingly great, as was the infinite sacrifice made in giving his son to die for sinful man. Those who really appreciate the work of the atonement, those who have the high sense of the sacrifice which Christ has made to exalt them to his throne, will count it a special honor to be partakers with him in his, in his, in his self-denial, sacrifice, and suffering that they may be co-workers with him in saving souls. There was an infinite sacrifice. The work of atonement requires, we talked about this, an actual payment. Something that we could never pay. Justice cannot be satisfied with the pretended sacrifice. <laughs> Only a real death that covers the entire human race is of any value. If the death on the cross was not sufficient for the entire race, then the atonement is gone. 
Alan White was shown that taking away the personality of God and the personality of his son would take away the sanctuary and the atonement would be gone. So how important is that Jesus is the literal son of God? Amen. Very important. She saw the dangers in changing our religion and tried to sound the alarm, but few have understood. I'm going to end it there. I don't want to get into what changes took place because you all know them very well. You know this. You should, we should all have this memorized. I spoke about it at the very beginning. And what God, she spoke about what the church was going to do to change is what the world has done, almost in her very writings, has done to change the political world. The religious world is using the exact same pattern. So, is there a parallel? Yes, there is. Was Jesus crucified through this parallel? Yes, he was. If we are living in these times, Jesus is soon to come. And we will experience what he did. Remember what he told the two brothers who came up to him who wanted to be at his right and his left? And what did Jesus tell them? Can you drink the cup that I am about to drink? And what did they answer? Yeah. Yeah. What did he answer to them? Indeed, you will. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you, Father, for Jesus. Amen? Amen. You know, and, and that's just the parallel I wanted to bring to that, to you today. So what do we have? We have our Bibles. Let's read them. Let's study them. Yes. You know? We have our experience attested to the, by the miraculous working of the Holy Spirit. We have a truth that admits of no compromise. Shall we not repudiate everything that is now in harmony with this truth? Hmm. And that's what I wanted to focus on. Jesus being the literal Son of God. Amen. His death on the cross having true meaning and what it means to you and I. Amen. With that, I'll close. Let's, let's bow our head and close with prayer. Dear Father, we thank you again, O oh Lord.